So what we decided to do is instead of sending out um, uh, certificates for CACFP is you'll just go out there and you'll find that if you attended, if you and you attended, then your, your training will show up. Um, so I just wanted to let you guys be aware because I mean, you guys have CECPD, which we don't do for this class, but um, if you need a training, you ha you can't use it, a certificate anyway. So that's why we just kind of decided to not, because it was just like one extra step that we were having to do with CACFP. So I just wanted you guys to be aware of that. Um, again, we're going to keep doing that from forever. We're not going to really change from that process. So I just want to let you know, and we do understand that a, multiple people might be on the same computer. So you are more than welcome to... Um, and I did notice, thank you for putting your name in the chat or you can send it to me directly. And just to let us know that way, we'll, we pull the chat as well when we pull the, the, the um, what I wanna call the attendance from the class. So that way we'll make sure. And I think, so our system, our training calendar, if you're not sure where to go to sign in, which I looked, I think everybody is, they're already in there, but the training calendar only pops up when somebody does, um, uh, when you have to log into your system. So I just wanted to let you know to make sure that you won't be receiving anything from us, but just give us about um, everybody. So we're here in the office, we're also teleworking again. So we're all in and out, but just give us a little bit of time. I would say today is Thursday, give us till mid next week and that stuff should be pulled over to show that you attended this training. Um, there is no video. Um, so, oh, that's fine. If you don't have video, that's okay. You don't need it. I don't have video on this laptop. We're supposed to be getting new ones, um, but I had uh, a chemical pill too. So if I did have a if I did have a video, I'd be turning it off because I look kind of scary right now. So, um, but thank you guys all for joining. We're going to go through this presentation. So this is the mill pattern workshop. Um, again, thank you guys for coming. We're just going to cover the CACFP mill patterns. If you have any questions, please put anything in the chat. I'm, I'm, I'm here by myself, but we got this. I, I've done this several, several times by my lonesome, but just, I may not answer your chat immediately, but I do pan over and look at everything. Um, I was gonna say, um, Patricia, I, um, you're doing at risk. I wanted to let you know before I got into this, that if you are a school district, a school district is allowed if you're doing at risk to not do CAC of P mill patterns, you can do the school mill patterns. So I just wanted to let you know that in case if you are on here, just so you are aware that you do not have to do CAC of P mill patterns, you can do NSLP mill patterns for at risk since you are a district. So you may not wanna participate in this. I didn't want you to have to sit through um, a lot of this if you don't have to, but I just wanna again, make you aware. You can, you can definitely do, you get the option as a school district to either do um, CACFP or the National School Lunch Mail Pattern since you are a school. If you are not a school district, you do not have that option. You have to do these mail patterns. So we're gonna get through the mail patterns and we also have an at risk. We've added a lot of training. I think you guys might be aware. We I just added trainings all the way until April. Um, we will probably um, think me adding more topics, but we've kind of broken everything up due to the fact um, Awesome, perfect. That's great if you want to use CACFP. I just wanted to make you aware because we had a lot of schools when I was first doing at risk um, training. They did they had no idea that they could do either or mill patterns. So good. I just wanted to make sure that you did not have to sit through anything you did not want to sit through. Um, but so we're adding a lot of trainings. If, so when you go to the training calendar, we're currently offering the mill pattern training. We're offering an at risk training that's a two hour. We are offering it's the administrative and um, procurement or purchasing functions that was so basically what we did is we took the big long full day one and we split it into two so we have the admin and purchasing which is all like the paperwork aspect and then we have the mill patterns and then we also have infants which we cover a little bit of infants in this but the other infants is about an hour and a half and um we have one we have multi-sided so if you have multiple eating sites or if you have multiple centers under one agreement number it's the additional low it's the additional information for that another one that i'd like to add and i'm really I'm working on it right now is a financial one so just so you're aware we have all these different options anybody who can come to them um we just wanted to make them smaller and then make it more focused on what you might be doing and who the person that maybe needs to listen to the information can get that information. 
So just again, get to know your consultant. Uh, you, you should have a training manual. If you do not have a training manual, then you can go to other res to resource library. That's where we have, we keep everything in our resource library. You can go out there and we also have a training manual. Of, and I would even suggest putting it on your work, on your desktop. Um, our, that's what our consultants do because they don't want to have to carry that book around with them everywhere. And they can use the find feature, which um, instead of having to flip through all these papers, you can just type in what you need and find what you're looking for. So may, if you go to page four though, that's where your consultant is. There is one thing I need to update. We've had some changes, not only in our office, but also in the field. I'm gonna kind of run down, um, cause I don't know who's come to what trainings, but so with CEC of Peaside, um, Jennifer Weber, who was our director of operations moved into the executive director position, Debbie Re Hamilton retired. And when, at, when she moved, we split up her her job into two. So we have a director of schools and a director of, of uh, daycares. So the director of, of daycare side at CACFP is Cassie Riddell. Um, I, Kendra Mervat, is am now into, I'm the director of training. So that's why you'll be seeing and hearing from me quite a bit. I was in the field for 10 and a half years. Um, but we have, so we, in our CACFP side, um, Rhonda Stevenson, who was on the CACAP side, she moved to our NSLP side, to our, day, our school side. So we have Lisa, who is still there. We also have um, Karen Davis. She took Edgar's position. Edgar is still in our office, but he took Cassie's old position. So he has moved to a different position. And then Jennifer Pryor, she did some summer feeding for us and now she's on staff and doing CACFP and summer feeding. So we have some new stuff. So if you hear these names, Karen and um, Jennifer and Lisa, just so you know, we just had, we've had a lot of changes. We've also had two new consultants um, that you may or may not be aware of. Um, Denise Wheeland retired in, I think February, everything's a blur right now. And uh, Leanne Rausch, who she was in CACAP, but then she's also been in school on the school side in the office for a number of years. She took over for De Denise Whelan and Pat Gower just retired, um, I think in mid-October, 1st of October. And Sandy Bullard has taken her position. Now, I that's what's not updated as Sandy's information. Leanne's is in there. But um, the phone number is the same for Sandy as it was for Pat. I just need to update. And I'm hoping to do that during this Christmas break. I'll get that information. So since we are teleworking right now, we have sometimes we're in the office, sometimes we're not. You can always contact us. You can still call by phone. Um, the, our, everybody is checking their voicemail while they are away. You can also email anybody on staff. But we do have a CAC of P email address, which is right here, the CAC of P at sde.ok.gov. Now this um, web, this email address, it goes to everybody in the CACFP team. So if you do again, have any questions or need to send anything to us, you can always send it to that location as well. And please do call your consultant. If you have any questions, if you're like, check my paperwork, how do you think I'm doing on this? Um, that's what we're here for. If you're not sure about certain things because things do change all the time, please reach out to your consultant. We are here to help. Our favorite part of our job is actually coming to help and do what we call technical assistance. It's not coming out to do reviews. A great website, this is the CNP website. This right here, the web address that's listed, this is where you would go to um, log into our the training manual actually to go into the training calendar. This is also, if you go here, you log in and this is where you have access to claims. If you do the claims, this is also if you log in to do the application, but a lot of you, you don't even have to log in to have access to what we call our resource library. We keep our memos in there. That's where we keep our training manual and also our interactive form. So if you have some paperwork that you do and you want them, maybe in Excel, something that you can type into, you can definitely use our interactive forms that we have located. It's under the, actually the tab worksheets. It's at the very bottom of the page, but that's what we keep in there. This is just what the page looks like um, whenever you do go and click on that website. This is what it will take you to and you can see the resource library there the second to the bottom you will not see the training calendar because you do have to log into the training calendar for it to pop up um, this is just an example when you when you click on the resource library which you do not have to log into to have access to um, so this i know this says from 2017 but we actually this is what it did look like up until recently we have done some changes to the resource library we um, added more headings to make it much much easier 
to um, to navigate. So like you'll now when you open it up your first you'll see at risk you'll see adults. So just make sure you we have a multi sided we have a mill pattern section so we're trying to make it a little bit break it up a little bit easier so if you for topics. So if you're needing anything, we have added a lot more topics in there, which makes it a lot nicer and everything's not so jumbled up. So just a reminder that you do have to keep all forms. They must be, be maintained daily by month at each site for all for any institution participating in CACFP. And again, all records must be kept at the location approved in the application. But just a reminder that every day you need to be keeping records. So if I come out today and I and I'm coming out today to do a review, and I come out and I'm talking to you about some things, I'm like, hey, I can ask you, be like, hey, I need to see your production record. Even though when we do a review, we do the we look at the re, the review month is always the last month that we claimed, that you claimed, we're validating that claim. But I can come out and say. And sit there and be like talking about something. Be like, hey, can I look at your production records from yesterday? I want to. I want to look at something. You have to have them up to date. If not, we will tell you that you cannot um, claim for the month. So they do have to be up to date because we can look. We can look at any other records. But I have done that before, where I'm like, hey, I was trying to show them something. I'm like, can I look at your production records? And then, but most of the time, they did happen. Thank goodness. Just something else that sometimes we may ask that we need um, all paperwork, everything that we that we look at during review, we may need copies of this. Um, part of it, luckily, it just worked out because of COVID. But what really has happened was this, we get audited by the USDA and state auditors. And the state auditors have told us that every single institution that we review, we they want every single bit of documentation that we look at, including the day of review. And again, it's not us, it's state auditor, but um, it, we, a lot of our consultants have been doing reviews remotely, except for they do have to come on site to like look at the mills, but it, it kind of has worked out to be a twofold. So they may ask you, you don't have to make copy, you can scan everything, but just don't be surprised or be like, we you've never had to do this before. No, we have never had to do this before. Um, but some of it is, again, luckily it's kind of been a twofold. We, some, we've been doing COVID, they've been doing reviews due to COVID um, remotely. A lot of them, some have not. And then, um, it, but it has been, it's been requested by the state auditor. It has not been requested by us. Something else that is new for this year is if anybody donates any products like food and or milk or formula or anything like that to you to the institution, you can no longer use it as part of the reimbursable meal. Donated items are served only as an extra. So if you do, I had a I had a daycare that um, it was at a church and there was a great and wonderful man and he always brought chips and he would fill out the donation form. Um, just because he loved those kids and wanted to give them something fun, so that you can serve it now, but you cannot, you can, you cannot serve it as part of the reimbursable meal. It's only as an extra. There's several reasons why this is going on, why this is now the case. But one is we are paying for a reimbursable meal, and we've had a lot of people in the, I mean, in the last few years that they're not spending the money that we give to them, they're not spending it all and that's a finding so it's kind of curbing a lot of things out of issues that we've been seeing. Um, in the system in in the program, let me. forgot to forward my phone i'm not used to doing my review my we have people in our conference room so i'm not used to doing my, the trainings in my office. Um, so milk loads over the mill pattern requirements. So the mill pattern requirements, um, if you could, I'm going to try something. To, let me see if I can try something today. I may not have put it in here. Um, no, I did not. Okay, so I know we have one person that is at risk and a school. Do we have anybody here that is um, adult daycare? By any chance? I don't think that we do. Yes. Oh, we do have, okay, perfect. I just want to make sure that I know who not to, um, what to uh, cover. So I will definitely cover adults today. So I'm glad that you could be here. You're my first one, it's been a while. Perfect, I'm glad that you're here. So we're gonna go over the mill patterns. Um, and also I sent you guys out some handouts and in those in handouts, there are infants in there. 
Um, so I know we have an adult daycare and I know that we have um, a school district. So does anybody have infants? And if just anybody just types yes, that you have infants at your school, because it just gives me an idea or at your facility, it just lets me an idea of if anything I can just skip over when we get to that section. So, okay, perfect. So we'll, we'll cover everything, which is not a big deal. Um, so you guys, I did send out a packet. Again, some of it's going to pertain to you. Some of it is not. Um, and I'm, I don't have the packet right here in front of me, but, um, and there may be more information I will give you. And again, the resource library has all of our information, especially like if you're an adult, always make sure to check that section because um, there's some things that pertain to you that do not pertain to other centers that they're not allowed to do. So um, breakfast, lunch, supper, and snack must follow the minimum meal pattern for each meal service. And those meal patterns, it was all given to you in that packet that I sent. And it, it's also on, um, in it, which page numbers will come up, pop up on here. So when we get to it, it if you want to make notes um, or if you have any questions, so there'll be a little blue block you'll see here momentarily and it'll have P on there and then we'll have numbers. So those are the page numbers in the training manual. If you have questions, you can always refer back to that. These, uh, what I sent you, these mill, the mill pattern training, all of this stuff, everything you see out there slide wise are gonna stay out there for the entire year because we're gonna keep doing Zoom training. So you can always, if you didn't print out the slides, they're always gonna be on the resource library and you can always go back and refer to them if you ever need them. Um, you also have five food components in CACFP, and that's what we'll also be going over. You must offer the minimum serving size for a reimbursable meal. And then the tr and then someone at your center is designated as a designated trainer, and they do have to cover the meal patterns when they do the training. So you may be getting a little bit more information, but it is a requirement from USDA that meal patterns are covered in a training done to the dish, to your institution by someone at the institution. So these are the grade groups. We have infants, we have one to two year olds, we have three to five, six to 12. If you're at risk, we have a 13 to 18 and then we have adults. And when we talk about adults, for those of you who are, don't understand what I'm talking about, um, adult, adult daycare. So it is not for you that have a daycare center and then your adults, you have adults that teach at your center or work for your center. That's not what we're talking about when we talk about adults. When I refer to adults, I'm referring to adults that are participants in an adult daycare center, not adults at your center that work for you. Um, these are adults that actually, we have adult daycares and it's for those that are either disabled or over age 60, 65. So it's not for just those that work at your center. These are those that attend and are enrolled in an adult daycare. So just to let you know, we do have some transition periods. We have a one month trans transition. So if when, it, when a child turns 12 months to when they turn one, there is a transition period. So, and I've, I've seen this before. I've been to a center and the mom wasn't quite ready for the child to be eating the meal patterns. Um, for the one-year-old, but we do give grace from 12 months to 13 months that they can be served with baby food or anything like that. So just to let you know, if you do have infants um, and once they turn one, that we have a transition period between 12 months and 13 months that they can kind of do either or meal pattern. So, but once they hit that 13 month period, they do have to start um, eating on the meal pattern requirements per USDA, unless you have a doctor's note. Now I'm gonna kind of preface that along the whole way, but everything I'm saying is what you have to do for you in USDA in order to be on the program. The only way anything can get waived is if you have a doctor's note. So for instance, we understand, again, I have also seen it where you may have a premature a bit premature baby and they're just not development, they're not developing, you know, they're not where they should be. So you may have a 14 month old that still cannot have salad foods, but I'm sure you would have a doctor's note regarding that uh, just saying that this child still has to be um, taking soft foods and not eating the meal pattern. So I just wanted to preface, um, this is what USDA guidelines are, but unless you have a doctor's note and you just need to do whatever that doctor's note says. So you can see here we have page 120 and page 331. So page 120 is for children and page 331 is our adults. Um, that's where you'll find the breakfast components. They're the same components for both. You'll have milk, vegetable, fruit, or both. And then you also serve a grain. 
Now there is a caveat, you are allowed to serve meat in place of a grain up to three times a week for breakfast only. Now, a lot of times I've seen a lot of people not replace the grain. They may just do like eggs and toast and that is perfectly fine, but um, you are allowed on CACFP to substitute um, a meat for a grain up to three times per week. So an example of that is um, say if you serve one ounce of meat meat alternate, it also is as one serving of a grain. Um, an example is the cheese omelet. You may choose, you can um, do a cheese omelet with fruit and milk. So again, up to three times a week for CACFP, you are allowed to substitute the grain for a meat. So this right here is page 120. This is for the child care. And you can also see we have the at rest side. Um, this is, lets you know about the minimum servings requirement that you are to serve. And again, it's found on page 120. Do you guys that have a child care center, do you have any questions regarding the minimum requirements? So you can always serve more, but we will take back funds if you do serve less. So as you can see here, we have, we have three age grade groups for a daycare center. We have one to two year olds, three to five and six to 12. Now, I would suggest to you if you do have, um, and I've seen it where you have say some two-year-olds and three-year-olds in the same room or some five and six-year-olds in the same room, you to make it easier on everybody, you may just wanna serve the three to fives to everybody in that room, even though you may have a couple of younger children. So again, this is the breakfast meal pattern. You have milk, which is four, six and eight ounces. You have vegetable, fruit, um, and then you also have a grains and this gives you all the information on the grains of how much to serve and it's located on that chart on page 120. If you are an adult daycare, again, you have the same components um, and you also saw the at risk on that, uh, the last uh, page as well that we just did this on located on 120. So you also have the same three, it's just your serving sizes are different. You have eight ounces of milk at breakfast, half a cup of fruit, and you need two grains per meal. So you can do up to two servings each day at breakfast for adult day. Are there any questions? If there's any questions, again, just put them in the chat. I'm watching it periodically, so um, I can never answer any questions. So the next item we have is lunch. And for lunch or supper, we have five components. We have milk, vegetable, fruit, grain, and meat, meat alternate. It is required at lunch and supper that all components must be offered. There is one small change that can be made and that's to the fruit and vegetable. You can serve two vegetables instead of a fruit. And we'll talk more a little bit more about that. So again, this is the meal patterns. This is just part of it for lunch and supper. Again, you have the milk, meat, grain, fruit, and vegetable are the five components that must be offered. And you are allowed to substitute um, the grain or the, the, veg, the fruit for a vegetable at lunch or supper. So again, this is located on page 121 if you have any questions regarding how to read some of this stuff. Um, so it, when you do a meat, they need one ounce, one and a half ounce or two ounces of meat. But what it's saying down here is because some of it, and we'll talk a little bit more about meat, meat alternate when we get to the components. When we talk about components, like this also breaks it up that if you do serve peanut butter, two tablespoons of peanut butter is one ounce. Um, three tablespoons is one and a half ounce and four tablespoons. So that's why it gives you more information because it does let you know if you use some of the meat, meat alternates, how much to serve of that to equal the same amount, which you can also use the food buying guide, but this is just some helpful, helpful hints. So in adult daycare, again, you would have the eight fluid ounces of meat. I mean, I'm sorry, of milk, two ounces of meat, uh, a half a cup of vegetable, a half a cup of fruit and two grains for lunch. You, The adults always have to, have, seems to have two grains where when it gets to uh, the daycare side, you only have to have one grain. Now you will see with the fruits and vegetables, um, you the da adult daycare is allowed a half a cup of fruit. The, the, I think every grade group, if you look at the meal patterns, which is located on page 122, 
um, they can only have the most is a half of a as a fourth of a cup. You'll have an eighth of a cup of fruit, a fourth and a fourth. For for the eighth of the cup is for the one to two year olds, but everybody else is only allowed a fourth of a cup of fruit. So the adults do get more fruit or get, get more. Yeah, they get more fruit than everybody else does. So when you when you do substitute a fruit or a vegetable for a fruit, um, it, and then what's so interesting to me is because some of the things that they're allowing, what, this always has baffled me. So the fact that it's allowed to substitute a grain for a meat and substitute a fruit for a vegetable, that is stuff that schools have been doing for a very long time, but they're actually not allowed to do that on their meal patterns, but they do allow for it for CACFP. But when you do substitute a fruit for a vegetable, it cannot be the same vegetable. It does have to be a different vegetable and it has to be the same serving size of whatever it was that you're doing. So at snack, this is, some people get this a little confused. So at snack, you yes, we have the five components, but you're only required to serve two. So, and they do not have to be a beverage. So a lot of times people have done, well, we have to do a juice or we have to do milk. You do not have to do it. You just have to serve two of the components. That's all that's required. You cannot serve a milk and a juice in the same meal. You have to, one has to be edible. So you can't just have two beverages. So just a reminder, you have to serve two different items, but you can pick the two of whichever you would like to serve for that day. And for the child, you can see we have, the, all five are listed and we give you the serving sizes. Um, but I do want you to note that at snack for childcare, for the fruit and vegetable, um, it increases on the six to 12 year olds, it increases to three fourths of a cup. So it does get a lot larger at snack than it does. So you have to make sure it's not the, re the requirements, the serving sizes do change for the most part at snack than it does for any of the other uh, between like fruit and vegetable are different at breakfast, lunch and snack. Um, now, as you can see here, milk is even different at snack. So it's usually four, six and eight, four, six and eight. And then here at snack, it's four ounces, four ounces and eight ounces. But if it is easier for you and your center, I you can always serve more. I would just tell them to do four, six and eight, four, six and eight and four, six and eight ounces. Um, again, so when you do look at snack and you go to the vegetable, um, it's a half a cup and a half a cup for ages one to twos and three to five. But when you get to the six to 12, it is three fourths of a cup. The same with the fruit. It's a half a cup, half a cup and three fourths of a cup. And we would see it quite a bit when we come out to do a review. If you serve a fruit or a vegetable, the serving size is larger, but you guys were not serving the correct amount. You guys were serving a half a cup versus the three fourths of a cup. So make sure you are checking the meal patterns. If you are not, like that's what these sheets are for that were sent to you in the packet um, is to give you the serving sizes that are required and that are needed. Again, I've seen a lot of issues at snack when it comes to people serving fruit and or vegetable, they just do not serve enough. And for adults, again, it's, it's still the eight ounces of milk. It's a one ounce of meat that you can do. Um, you have a half a cup and a half a cup. So yours is actually smaller um, when it comes to the fruits and veggies at snack. And then you, at this point, you only have one grain to serve at snack. So you get a little bit better. Um, and I'll talk more about the fruits and veggies again when we move on to the component side. But um, what, we see, what I see is the issue is if you're serving a banana or an orange at snack, because in the food buying guide, a banana or an orange is only a half of a cup. So if you serve that at snack, you need to give them one and a half bananas. But if you serve it to them at lunch, they only need a half a banana at lunch because they only need a fourth of a cup. But at breakfast, they need a half a cup of vegetable and one banana is half a cup. So kind of a little tidbit, if you're gonna serve, if you're gonna serve juice, I would suggest that you do it at snack because of the three fourths for the older kids. Um, that way, an, an apple though, one medium sized apple is one cup. So that might help a little bit in what to decide what you serve for a snack as a fruit or a vegetable. And just again, if you are at risk in a school district only, 
um, you have the option of doing the school lunch program or doing the CACFB program. Now, and that's what we're kind of going to go over when we talk about this is uh, the schools will definitely see the difference. Um, and it's because, so when I first started, I've been on staff at 12 and a half years, um, the school and CACFP meal patterns were the exact same. And then they changed the schools in 2012 and then they changed daycares in 2017 and they're going in completely different directions. So just a reminder, if whatever, whichever you choose, you have to stick with, you can't be like, well, but we wanna do this because we do school, it's one or the other. What ATR, this says ATR 37, is we have an at-risk manual, and this is on in the at-risk manual that is located in the resource library. If it's on page 37, if you want to read more about, if you're a school, how you can do um, school meal patterns. We have some more information on Teen Nutrition website, if you want to go out there and look for it. Um, we try to put everything that we really like out on our website as well. So again, we have all, all the information um, but if you want more resources or maybe you want maybe posters or anything like that, please go out to Team Nutrition and um, see what they have that might be helpful for you or your center or your school. So now we're going to go over the components. So fluid milk. So at one year of age, it's unflavored whole milk. Um, from two to five years of age, it's unflavored fat-free skim or unflavored. Uh, it, basically, they can only have white milk, but it can be either skim or 1%. Now, from 6 to 12, 13 to 18 is at risk. In adults, there's one change on here that you may or may not notice. I don't know if, you're, if you do this, but you can have unflavored skim milk or low-fat 1%, or you can have flavored skim milk. Now, it used to be you could have flavored 1% milk, and then a situation kind of happened with USDA. They had to go back to taking that away, but it's they're trying to get it back again. So, but right now, if you are doing 1%, um, if you are a daycare center and you are doing 1% flavored milk, you do need to um, halt that. Um, schools, uh, you, have a, you have a waiver, you have other situations on your other end. And so anyway, but if you're a daycare at this point, you do need to stop serving flavored fat free. And if you do have any infants, again, they cannot have milk they can, um, an infant is from birth to 12 months, up to 12 months. So they can only have iron fortified formula or breast milk. They cannot substitute milk for formula if you're an infant. And again, we have another transition period and this is for milk. Um, so you can do low fat. You have to switch to low fat or fat free when they're 25 months, but we do allow for you to mix or to serve a whole or reduced fat for that one month to transition them into the skim milk or the fat free. I'm sorry, the low fat or the, the fat free. So breast milk. You can still have serve breast milk after age one. Um, if you do, if they do, if the parent does it express, a parent can come on site to breastfeed at any age. Um, but if they give you express, where that's where you know they give it to you in a bottle or some other form is how they give it to you. Um, after age one, a mother, if the mother brings like say a fourth of a cup and they need um, a half a cup total, then you would have to supplement the other one fourth cup. For what they need. So again, if you have a parent that gives breast milk, it can be served in lieu of milk, but it still has to be in the same re um, uh, requirements. Then the the serving size has to be the same as it would be if they were just drinking milk plain. So this is only for our adult daycare. Once per day, yogurt can replace fluid milk. We're gonna talk more about yogurt and um, there's some sugar requirements, so it has to meet that, but it credits for only one food component in a single meal. So again, if you, for our adult daycare center, once per day, you are allowed to substitute yogurt in place of fluid milk. So we have what's also called a milk substitution. So what a milk substitution is, it, it's the center basically allowing so it's, sometimes it, we've had this for a while. It's in also in schools as well. The milk substitution is something that the institution, the daycare is offering their participants. So it's it's at the cost of the, it, the institution has to pay for the cost, but it's basically saying we're not just offering milk, but we're also so offering a soy product and it's available to anybody. 
So if you do this, it is the, the institution does have to pay for it. The milk substitute does have to meet these requirements. Uh, the parent can sign, you do have to have a, a written statement. We do have a form, it's on page 129, that a parent does have to sign saying that, and they have to give a reason why they want their child to have it. The reason can't be because they don't like milk, um, but the reason can be maybe religious issues, maybe um, dietary issues, but the only milk substitutes that have been found are a soy product. Um, if you have something that you're interested in serving that you think might meet these nutrient requirements, please send it to us or your consultant and we, will, we can look at it further. Um, the one thing that I've told people to, if you're interested in serving something, take a look at the protein first. Um, if the protein meets, it might meet. We did have someone last year send us an almond milk that had 10 grams of protein, but when you looked at the potassium, it only had like 300 milligrams. And if you can see here, it needs at least 349 milligrams. So um, the ones that we have found, I'm gonna type one into the um, chat. If you do it, I've, I've heard uh, the, um, what was it? Walmart brand, soy, uh, oh, it keeps changing on me. Um, Walmart brand soy and um, eighth continent. And last I saw it, it was like in a cream container and then it had a yellow like sun on it. There's one with the blue sun, but it is vanilla, which you can no longer serve flavored um, if they're under age five. But those are the only two. Uh, there is, I think, one called Pacific, um, Pacifica, but you could really, to be honest, it's the same price as a continent, but it's in half. It's the same price, but the container is half and you get it like at Whole Foods. And there is another one called, I think, Pearls that a lot of schools get. I haven't seen many people do this, um, but you, I mean, it's just, it is an option for you to do the milk substitute if you want. I just don't, I haven't really seen school or daycare that offered to do this for their students. And it also does depend upon your clientele. Um, for your clientele, you may have a lot of people for religious reasons, they don't drink milk, or you have a lot of people, their lifestyle is they're vegan, so they don't do any byproducts of um, animals. So it may be great, be like, yes, we would love to offer this option to our parents because they don't, their kids won't drink milk because uh, of their lifestyle. So it is just an option. Now, if you, you would, would you would need a medical statement? It is required when a disability requires a non-dairy beverage that is not nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk. So if you have a parent that they want their child to have almond milk or coconut milk, it is, and to be honest, silk doesn't meet. Silk only has, the last I saw, silk has seven grams of protein. It doesn't even meet the nutrient requirements. So if it does not meet the nutrient requirements, again, um, you do have to have a doctor's note. So we have seen doctor's notes where the doctor may say um, no milk, silk, then you buy silk because that's what the doctor's note said. So you always just do what the doctor's note states. Um, if it states something specific, then you can do specifically, even though it may not be on our program, but you just always do whatever the medical statement does state. Um, a medical statement, um, it's on page 188 if you want more about it. We do have a form. Our form is not required. What we like about our form is it does have what is, needs to be substituted, but a lot of times um, the doctor won't put what to substitute. They just may say like no milk. Uh, they don't tell you what to substitute with. So, and that's okay. We just, we make forms for everything just to try to make it a little bit easier for you guys. Um, it must be signed by a recognized medical authority and it should, but it usually doesn't recommend an alternate food. Um, a meal cannot be claimed of lacking required components or quantities, again, unless you have a medical statement. And then you may make a non-medical substitution with, with documentation. It does not include milk because you have the, subs the milk substitution form. But what we mean like this is, say you have a child who's allergic to um, oranges, and so you substitute the oranges for strawberries for that one child um, because it's a, it's a, it's a non-medical substitute. Um, well, I guess what they mean, like, so technically, if you're not, re if you have strawberries, you give a child strawberries instead of oranges because maybe they're allergic to them, you can give it to them, but the, what they state with USDA is if it's not a, a medical emergency, but we really want you to get a medical statement on everybody because it just protects you. 
but we're not gonna like we're not gonna say no you have to serve them strawberries when you're like no they're alert or whatever they're allergic to xyz and you give them something that's substitute but it meets requirements it's still a fruit and you give them the right amount of fruit we're not gonna be we're gonna tell you to get a doctor's note but we're not gonna we're not gonna put that child's life in danger or anything like that so um but it, you can't again if it's a non-medical substitution you can do that um, you can, as long as the kid is getting all the required components and the required um, serving sizes, that is the one thing that we mostly look at. So fluid milk, again, it's mostly one to two year olds get uh, a half a cup, three to five year olds get three fourths of a cup and six through adults get one cup or eight ounces. So something that I wanted you guys to be aware of something that we see when we come out to do reviews is milk is milk is one if you are short on milk when we come out to do your review then we will take back if you did not if you so if we come out and you needed for the month of review 50 gallons of milk and we look at your receipts and you sir and you only purchased 40 gallons of milk we're going to take back every single meal that um, had milk in it so that'd be every breakfast every lunch and any snack that had milk so what what there's a few reasons why this happens um and it's not always just because you didn't so some of the things that may cause this is one i've seen is you're not buying the right cup size if you're doing cups so if you are buying the eight and a half ounce styrofoam cup for your six through adults you would have to fill that 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 cup up all the way to the very 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 top brim not the little lip that's below it, but the very, very, very top brim. And that's where people are getting short on milk because they were not serving the correct amount because they weren't buying the, the right cup size. They were buying again. So make sure if you have, if you need eight ounces, you're buying at least a nine ounce cup or larger. Um, Cause also if when you serve out meals, it has to have the requirement when you serve it out, it has to be in the cup the first time. You can't be like, well, I'm giving them half now. I'm gonna give them half later. Um, you can only do that if you're if you're family style, which is not allowed right now. Um, per the per anybody that's on Head Start, do I have any Head Starts in here? But anybody I do know that's on a federal program, they have halted the the family style. So the other reason that we see that this happens is because if you are measuring it yourself, if you're not using the right measurement tool. So if you're using the plastic, like you can see, we have a dry measurement that's marked out, and we have a liquid measurement. Now, if you're using the dry measurements, you're gonna be an ounce short. We used to do a demonstration with this. We would put it in two cups and show you the difference. There was about an ounce difference in each of the cups. So if you are gonna measure out, do not use the dry, don't use the dry measuring for a liquid. You have to use the liquid measuring for a liquid because if not, it will make you short on milk as well. So just be very cautious um, of that. But those are the two main things that I see um, when it comes to milk that people are short from is because they're not serving, how they're not serving enough, how that happened. So now we're gonna go over the grains component. So you are required to serve at least one whole grain item per day. So say if you're at risk and you only serve one meal, that one meal must be whole grain rich. All other grains must be made with enriched or whole grain meal, flour, or bran or germ, and that's usually never a problem. We usually don't see that as an issue. But just a reminder, you must serve at least one grain per day that you serve must be whole grain rich. I'm going to go over a couple of ways of how you can tell if it's a whole grain rich product. You can go type in WIC approved whole grains. It will pop stuff up. If the first ingredient is listed as whole, if the first ingredient is water, but the second ingredient says whole something, like whole corn, whole grain, whole wheat, um, FDA, if it has the FDA whole grain statement on there, or if you have proper documentation from a manufacturer or a standardized recipe. So if you are to open up your Google browser, and type in WIC approved whole grain, it's gonna pop up some whole grain options. Anything listed in there can be served as a whole grain, but it has to be the exact same one. So you can see here, there's two nature zones just in this picture. 
So you it has to be the exact same item that you are purchasing. Now you are going to have to keep your um, your wrappers or your like keep your bread bag if it's a whole grain. If you're serving something whole grain rich, you have to keep the documentation. So you have to keep um, like say a bread bag if it's your cereal. And I'll show you. I'll tell you what to if you have cereal. So a lot of times your cereal will be whole grain. If you just cut out the side panel, the side panel will tell you what the, what the product is. It will tell you the sugar amounts in it and it will also tell you the ingredients. So, so these are just an example. We have a whole list on page 159 of items that are whole grain. So if you buy bread and the first thing that it says is crushed wheat, then that is a whole grain product. If you serve oatmeal, that's automatically whole grain, if you serve wild rice or brown rice, um, quinoa, those are all whole grain items. Um, you'll see on here, Graham is on here. Graham is a whole grain. So people automatically, some whole, some graham crackers are whole grain, some are not. If you look at the ingredient list for graham crackers, graham flour is not the first ingredient. It's actually one of the last ingredients. The first ingredient is usually regular flour or a whole grain flour. So just make sure if you're curious, if you look at something, um, when you mostly your pastas are gonna be whole durum. So as long as it says the world whole, or if it says rye berries or wild rice or whatever it says at the beginning, as long as it's located on that page 159, you can serve it as a whole grain rich item. Now, this is the whole grain health claim, to be honest with you, yes, if it has it on here on your product, then it can be served as a whole grain. But to me, you're going to have to carry your book around or carry the slide around and make sure this, find the statement, make sure the statement matches this. And again, we have to have the documentation. You have to keep the package. To me, I feel like it's just a lot easier to go after the ingredients list. So we're going to take a look at this, the, at this whole, it's called a white whole wheat breadstick. And we're going to look at the ingredients list and we're going to see is this whole is this whole wheat white whole wheat breadstick a whole grain product whole grain rich product and you may see that you may see where it says like white we a lot of schools were doing it as as well at the very beginning but you'll see some white some white whole wheat or white whole grain flour or breads it is a thing it does exist um, so and the kids like it it's real it's good but does this product meet? So the first ingredient was a whole grain and the remaining ingredients were enriched or whole grain. So yes, that bread, that breadstick was a whole grain rich item. Now, if you make anything from homemade, if you make anything from scratch, if you make pancakes from scratch, um, if you make your own bread or your own rolls, but the most common is maybe breakfast items or muffins, for it to be considered a whole grain rich product or item, 50% of it must be whole grain. The other 50% must be enriched or all purpose. So what this means is if you have a recipe, let's just say you have a pancake recipe that you're making and it calls for two cups of flour, you'll do one cup of flour, a whole grain flour. The other one cup will be um, say all purpose flour. And all you have to do on your production records or your menu is serve form is write down two cups of flour. And just tell us that, that, or you can even tell us like one cup whole grain, one cup um, enriched or all purpose flour. You can't make anything with all whole grain flour because it will be flat as a pancake. It, I mean, pun intended, I know we're just talking about pancakes, but it will be hard as a rock. So um, that's why when it's whole grain rich, we talk about 50 50. All whole grain rich products are not 100%, like the, the product in it is not 100% whole grain because it would not be really edible. It'd be really dense and very, I make a, I make a very dense on purpose muffin and it's super dense. So again, um, when you make anything from scratch, just 50% of it has to be whole grain and the rest of it can be a, um, uh, an, an all purpose flour. So breakfast cereals. So if you do any breakfast cereals, it cannot contain any more than six grams of sugar per dry ounce. Um, Grain-based desserts are also no longer allowed to credit towards the grain component. Um, when we talk about breakfast cereals, it includes ready-to-eat, instant, and regular hot cereal. And this requirement is for all age groups. So we're gonna go over what you can and cannot serve 
Um, again, sugar, so schools focus on sodium. CAC of P focuses on sugar. So that's the big difference. So we've had, and this has happened before, people will call and complain and be like, well, my kid got this at, this at school. Um, they got a donut at school today and we're not allowed to serve donuts. So they're not, they're not meeting the requirements. It's because school's requirements are different than CACFP. So I just want to remind you of that because um, I've had people call in before that they're like, well, we own a daycare. We know the rules. Well, the rules are different for schools and the rules are different for daycares. So just be aware. So the easiest way with the cereal to know if it is a one that does meet the sugar requirements is a lot of people did this is you just type in the Oklahoma type in Oklahoma WIC approved cereals and it will pull up a list. This is the website, but this is what the list will look like. Um, a lot of people have done this. You can just print a page off like this to show that it's on there. I mean, I there's Target on here. The most popular ones that I had seen was the frosted mini wheats the multigrain Cheerios and Kicks. Now, an alphabet, I've seen a little bit of alphabets there because they're pretty, they're the most sweet. Now you'll see on here that there is the multigrain Cheerios, but Honey Nut Cheerios is not on here. It does not meet the sugar requirements. Now Kicks, um, the Kicks berries were the most popular. I've heard that you can't, find, some people have not been able to find them. But again, if you want to serve anything, you do still have to keep the label because we still have to know that you're buying that product. But um, you are allowed to just, instead of you not having to do the math, you can just, oh, and the frosted mini wheats, like I said, that's a, another real common one that people have done. Um, but you do have to still keep that, keep that side panel because you do have to keep all your labels to let us know that that's what you bought, which we do see it on receipts, but sometimes your receipts don't give us every, all the information that we need. What are some grain-based desserts? So some grain-based desserts are breakfast bars, brownies, uh, Nutri-Grain bars, toaster pastries or Pop-Tarts, sweet rolls, cinnamon rolls, granola bars, cookies. Um, these things are not allowed to be served on CACFP. I know it's hard, especially if you're adult daycare, I can't imagine. Um, I know the sweet tooth my grandpa has um, with his dementia but grain-based desserts are no longer allowed and they have not been allowed for about three years um, for CACFP. So your sugar, your cereals have to meet the sugar requirements and then these are items that you are not allowed to serve. Now it says sweet pie crust and it just, we just laugh about it because a pie crust is a pie crust, but um, it says sweet. Uh, you can make a chicken pot pie with a pie crust, but you can't have a pie, so. I, I don't know. <laughs> so we do have in the packet that you were given, it has a grain ch chart in it. So anything that is read in that grain chart cannot be served and claimed for on CACFP. So just make sure if you're serving it for CACFP that um, if it's listed in red or if you have some questions, if you can serve it or not, to make sure that it is not it is not in red to serve it. Um, I will tell you, we consider, so when we when these first came out, USDA took away graham crackers and animal crackers. They brought them back. Um, but we do tell people like, if you're gonna buy animal crackers, please don't do the iced ones. Um, Cause the, it's this example right here, some foods are not easily identifiable. Um, like for instance, there's one that we found that was called a breakfast round. Well, when you look at it, it really is a oatmeal raisin cookie. Now, if if it if it's really a cookie, consider it a cookie because like I said, USDA took at first graham crackers and animal crackers away. We don't want them taking more things away. You can do muffins and we understand if you buy the Otis Spuntmeyer, the big muffin um, variety at say Sam's, that it will have zucchini and banana nut and carrot, and then it also has a chocolate chocolate chip. Yes, you can serve a muffin, even if it is a chocolate chocolate chip, but just please, we understand that you're buying it in bulk and it comes with others, but try not to, just be cautious. Now, if you serve like vanilla wafers, that is considered a cookie. So vanilla wafers are not allowed on CACFP. So I just wanna make you aware of this. Um, I think most of you are, but this is the big difference again between schools and CACFP. Um, 
Now, what we have had in the past is some have asked about grain-based desserts, like what can you do? An example of that is, is we had a daycare center that for 20 years, they, did, they um, served donuts at their center. And they didn't want to really stop doing this. So they said, what was our options? Because the kids enjoyed it, they enjoyed it. What can we do? So her options were, she could serve the donut and not claim the mill, which you can always do. You can serve anything and not claim the mill. Or what she chose to do is um, she had a donut she served the donut for breakfast, but she served milk, she served a fruit, and then she served a yogurt, and she used the yogurt as her component. And then the donut was just an extra. So, and I know that you guys may not be handling the food purchasing form, but the donut is an, anything that's an extra like a donut, um, not if it's an ingredient, like Velveeta is not allowed, like you can't use Velveeta as a, um, as a meat meat alternate, but it is an ingredient. So say if you're making macaroni and cheese, you're using the macaroni as your, your grain. But if you're serving complete extra item like a donut, then it does, you cannot charge it off to CACFP because it is an additional item and it, the, the you can't charge anything that's not CACFP to CACFP, so. Now, just a reminder, you do have to keep your labels on all this stuff. And, and I didn't really go over how to calculate um, the cereal, but I am going to with the yogurt, which is the same concept. So we're going to do that here in just a moment. Um, but I did want to let you know, so it, in your packet, we put in there a yogurt and we put in there a, um, a cereal, like how much, like if you bought it, how much cereal it can have in it. It's a great chart. Well, we kind of improved on it a little bit and we put it in the training manual. So instead of having to find this form, it is now located in the training manual. So you don't have to search for that. And actually I like our form a little bit better than the one that USC did. Theirs is prettier, but our form, I feel like it just makes it very, very clear. But as a reminder, if you do not serve one whole grain rich item per day, then um, we will take back that meal or the meal with the lowest reimbursement. So say for that day, you don't serve a grain at breakfast, you chose to do a, a cheese omelet and maybe at snack that day you did apple and peanut butter. So the only grain that you served was at lunch. Um, then that one lunch item has to be whole grain rich. And if it wasn't, then we would take that meal back. What I've had some people do is they just buy whole wheat bread and they're like, we're serving it for breakfast. I don't care what we're having for breakfast. We're always gonna serve toast at breakfast just to serve the one whole grain rich item and per day. So they just knew that they did that. And they just put it, like I said, every day, no matter what they were serving. So you can do something like that too. But please, please make sure that you are keeping your labels because we do have to have and see copies of these labels. I and mean, if you don't, then that if you don't have copies of your labels, then we can take back the meal because you don't have sufficient documentation showing us that the product was allowed. So I just want you to be re reminded of that. We do have to have labels on your cereals. Um, again, if you serve any items that don't, like, like if it's a cookie, that cannot be charged off to CACFP. We, it needs to be taken off your receipt from us, like just kind of marked through or just said not claimed because again, those items are not allowable on CACFP. Now, meat, meat alternate. Um, again, a meat meat alternate can be in place of uh, the grain three times per week at breakfast. Tofu now credits as a meat. You can serve yogurt, including soy yogurt. It credits as a meat meat alternate, except for infants. You can do regular yogurt for infants, but you cannot do soy yogurt for infants. So yogurt, you have to use a commercial yogurt product. You cannot do anything that's homemade. Um, again, yogurt may be used as a meat meat alternate for milk or a milk substitute for adults only. And then four ounces credits as a one ounce of meat meat alternate. And again, we have the sugar requirement, so it cannot contain any more than 23 grams of total sugar per six ounces. And this is for all age groups. It's for anybody participating in CACFP. So we're going to talk about how do you meet do the yogurt requirements. So we had a good question one of in one of the last trainings that we did that it talked about um, the total sugars or sugars. So if it has sugar and total sugar or sugar and then sugar added, you have to total them up. You have to do all the sugar. 
So um, again, you're only allowed 23 grams per sugar per six ounces. So we're gonna use this. If you ever have any questions regarding anything that you can or cannot serve, your consultant, the number listed in the training manual on page four, those are all work cell phones. So I had told my people when I was in the field, I said, if you have a question, take a picture of the product, the front, take a picture of the nutrition facts label like this right here and send it to me and tell me what you want or need to know. And I will let you know if it meets or does not meet. So that's what I had several do that with yogurt. Um, we have found, it seems like YoPlay does, their yogurts do tend to all meet. I haven't really heard of any yet of theirs that do not. Um, but we're gonna take a look at this nutrition facts label. So per six ounces, um, this one has 19 grams of sugar. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to our chart. And again, this is what our chart looks like in the training manual. So we're gonna go down to the six ounces I'm gonna scroll all the way over to zero to 23 grams. And that, that yogurt only had 19 grams, so it does meet requirements. Again, whatever yogurts you are serving, you need to have a copy of the Nutrition Facts label. And I'd take a copy of the front too, um, give us the whole picture of what product you're serving with the Nutrition Facts label to let us know that that product does meet requirements that you are serving. One other little caveat that we did kind of find with YoPlay is um, you'll see here that we have ounces and grams. So grams, if it says grams or ounces someplace on the box or on the product, make sure you cut that. Like you'll play if you buy the Go-Gurt, but make sure you cut it off where it says um, on the box, uh, one tube equals, I think it was 2.5 ounces. I think that's what it was. Because um, with YoPlay, we found one where the ounces met, but the but on the serving size, but the on, when you look at the grams and the sugar amount, it didn't mat, it didn't meet. And USDA says that you always go by ounces. Ounces is trumps grams. Grams are only used if if ounces are not available. So I hope that helps with the chart. Do you guys have any questions regarding the yogurt and the sugar? Again, we have it for cereal as well, but this is the, kind of the example that we have, but it does have to meet. So one thing that USD has said, and the same with cereal, you cannot buy, a, so you can't buy a plain yogurt and a sugar, and then one that is over sugar requirements and mix them together. That's not allowable. Um, what they did say that you can do is like, for instance, on cereal. So what I had some do would they be like Cheerios and they'd be like cutting that Cheerios and mix them together. They can't do that. But what they can do is they can buy the Cheerios and serve the Cheerios. And then they can put maybe cups of honey nut Cheerios on the table and let kids put some on their cereal. But again, since honey nut Cheerios do not meet requirements, you cannot charge it off to CACFP. It would be an extra expense at, for the center. So just, a, just an FYI, but you can't mix them ahead of time. You have to give them, so when you mix them ahead of time, how do you know you gave them the correct amount of the component? So now we're gonna talk about fruit and vegetable. So again, vegetables and fruits are two separate components except at breakfast. Um, it limits the serving of juice to once per day because of the lack of fiber. And um, a vegetable could replace the fruit component at lunch or supper. Now, um, something else that's on here is if you do have infants, um, actually it's on the next page, I see it. Um, so we talk about fruit juice. So again, it must be pasteurized. Um, you can do juice blends or puree. So it contributes to the food component that is most prominent. What that means is if you buy apple juice, the first ingredient is apple. So that means it would be a fruit. If you buy V8 juice and the first ingredient is a tomato, then that would be a vegetable. Now, again, it doesn't matter if it's a fruit. It doesn't matter if it's a vegetable. You can only serve juice once per day. Juice is not allowed for infants. So just a reminder that you, for infants, you cannot um, serve juice at all. It, you used to be able to at eight months, you can no longer do that. Um, and then again, juice can only be served once per day. If you serve it twice or more, we will be taking back meals. So just remember that. Please. Okay, now this is mostly known for infants, but it's actually for all age groups, is that a parent may contribute 
to, they can provide one credible food component for, meal, for a reimbursable meal. The most common is um, formula or breast milk. And um, a lot of times the parent will bring the formula and then the center provides everything else. It's actually good for all age groups. A parent can provide one creditable component. It has to be creditable. It can't be something like, so if they were, they're like, oh, I have a four-year-old, I want my four-year-old to have almond milk. That is not a creditable component for CACFP, unless there was a doctor's note. But if the parent's just like, no, I'm, I'll just bring the milk myself. Um, they, it has to be a creditable product. product. Now we talked about donated foods earlier and we got this question about, um, but is it considered a donation? It's not considered a donation because when a parent is bringing one component, they're bringing it for their child only, they're not bringing it for the rest of the center. So um, just FYI that a parent can bring one meal component as long as it's creditable and meets requirements, um, they can't bring more, the center has to pay for everything else and provide everything else. So I hope that makes sense. Water, so water does have to be, it is required that it is be offered throughout the day. It is not a component. It's just, I mean, USDA requires it, DHS requires it, that they just want water to be available. You can't put, you can't serve it in place of milk, um, but again, you can just offer it on alongside of it, but it just does have to be offered throughout the day. Now we're going to talk a little bit about infants. Um, this is a condensed infants. Um, the other infants, like I said, it's about an hour, hour and a half. Um, so if you do have teachers and somebody else, this is just the condensed version of infants. I do suggest coming to the infants training. Um, I think it just gives a little bit more detail and how to fill out the paperwork. But um, if you do have infants, you must offer the CACFP meal program to them. Um, if they do not want to participate, a parent can fill out the infant meal waiver form. And that means you, the parent can bring everything at that point. Uh, you do have to offer, if you do have infants, you are required to offer a minimum of one type of iron fortify infant formula. It does have to be FDA approved. It just can't be bought outside of America, which we don't really have that issue here in Oklahoma since we're a lock-in state. Um, and then infants, we consider them are from birth to one year. And infants are also feed on demand. So you do feed the other kids based on the times listed in your application. So when it's like you do breakfast at eight, then you do breakfast at eight, but, but infants are feed on demand. So you can, serve, uh, you can serve them whenever they need to be fed. They do not, they do not fall into those time, timelines. We do have two age groups for, for infants. We have birth through five months, and then we have six months through 11 months. So both of those age groups require iron fortified formula, breast milk, or a combination of both. And then again, milk is not served to infants. It's not reimbursable unless you have a doctor's note regarding that. So we call this infant meals updates. I'm still trying to think of a better wording for this. This is from when the meal patterns came out in 2017. But at the from the changes from then is infants that are breastfed on site can be reimbursed. So a parent can come on site and um, breastfeed and have that as a reimbursable meal. Vegetables and or fruits must be served at snack. Uh, juice, cheese food, or cheese spreads are no longer creditable. And again, yogurt, but not soy and whole legs are credible as a meat meat alternate. Ready to eat cereal, bread, or crackers can only be served at snack and claimed at snack. They're not allowed at breakfast or at lunch for infants. Um, I know if you have a parent on site, it's like, how do I record this? You don't know the amount. You can just put on the form. You can put breastfed on site or mother on site whenever, and just make sure you indicate that they were breastfed. So from birth to five months, um, breast milk or infant formula is the only component required. They must have at least a serving of four to six fluid ounces of expressed milk or infant formula. And then again, just the benefits of breast milk is it generally, it's usually best, but we understand not every parent, um, uh, you know, breastfeeds, but they just wanted to notate that it's very beneficial for them to do that. So we have next component is six or 12 months. Now, this is what gets a little bit interesting. Um, and we talk about a little bit more in the infants one, but a, 
so you do have to have a minimum of six to four, six, I'm sorry, six to eight fluid ounces of express breast milk or infant formula that has to be offered. Um, again, it's six to eight ounces. And that's what gets daycares in trouble is when kids are eating more table food, like up at 10 to 11 months old, they may not be drinking six to eight ounces. They may be lowering their formula intake to maybe four ounces. Um, but you must offer them at least six to eight in order to claim the meal. If they're not getting the six to eight, I would probably, um, as a parent, I wouldn't want you to, if I was supplying the formula, I would not want you to waste formula to claim a meal. I would probably just do the meal waiver. Um, but foods from all components may be served when they when the child is develop, developmentally ready. So what you'll notice if you look at the infant meal pattern form, which is on page 197 to 199, is all of them say from zero to two either ounces or zero to four tablespoons. So what that means is it recognizes that all infants are not readily ready for solid foods at six months old. To be honest with you, my nieces, um, I have, I kind of share the story all the time. I have two nieces that are three and five. Um, they're same pediatrician. Their pediatrician did something completely different with them. Um, both kids. So most, the reason, the reason for this, in my opinion, just knowing how my nieces were handled as babies is one of my nieces, the five-year-old was given infant form, infant cereal. That was what she started out with. And then she did the fruit. It's kind of the normal thing. The three-year-old, they never even gave her infant formula or infant cereal. They gave her fruit. So that's the thing is we understand that they may give one item and they may not give the item for very long or they may switch it. They may start them out with a the meat. They may It gives the pediatrician and the family options of what they want to start their kids out with. But once, and then they under, we understand too that a child may eat fruit for one week and then they don't, or a couple of days and they're not handling this fruit very well. So then they're like, let's try a vegetable instead. So they're not serving it. So we understand that when we look at your production records, your infant forms, that it may jump around a little bit. But once there is consistency, so around seven or eight months, um, there should be con some consistency that, that you, you need to be feeding the child. Like if there's now like, okay, every day they're having the fruits and the veggies, or if they're having a plate, like maybe they're eating a plate of food um, that you make sure you write that down. But once they do start eating, you do have to write it down that they are eating that. Again, we understand that at first they might be bouncing around. And my niece has actually started eating at four months old and not at six. So, and if they do eat earlier, then yes, you can still claim the meal and then you do have to give them the form. You do have to give them the food. Again, the parent can bring one item, but then the center has to, has to uh, bring, has to supply everything else to claim the meal. But you do whatever is the parent is doing. So my thing, and this is, I need to talk to some, I, there was someone I need to talk to who they have a center and they have a form that they use with their parents. And I highly, it's optional, but I would highly, highly, highly suggest it. It's basically is to cover the daycare's rear end, but with, and that lets us know what's kind of going on too. And you're not getting in trouble. So it's like, what did you give my kid today? It's like, well, we discussed, or, the, you know, if a parent comes in, you're probably doing what the parent's asking them to do. So if the parent's writing down, like we're starting um, fruit and then get, list like five fruits, um, you then you know what to serve them. It's helping you also know what to do with their child and then just keep documentation of that. And then like when they change it up, it, they just have them sign it um, of what they're doing. So that way you're following the preference. It's approved food components. It's outlining what they're eating. I think it just helps saves you, but it's also great for us when we come out to, to do a review because we do also understand that like um, they may be getting some medication so they can't eat such and such for a bit. I mean, it, it all happens, but I just think having that communication and having written statements from the parents just helps protect you. Did you guys have any questions about components? Are you guys good? Are you awake? as I'm struggling today. It's cold and rainy. I just wanna be home in my PJs. Okay, let's see here. Okay, so now let's talk about crediting information. Um, so these are just some tidbits. Um, some of this at the beginning is stuff that we see. 
So if you're going to do any raw leafy green, like I mentioned to you with some of the, the vegetables or the fruit earlier about the banana being one banana, average size banana is a half a cup. One average medium size apple is one cup. One um, average size orange, not a mandarin, but an orange is a half a cup. Well, the same thing kind of applies with the raw leafy greens. So when you serve raw leafy greens, it is, um, when you serve one cup, it actually only equals a half a, half a cup of vegetable because it's, I just call it fluffy. I mean, have you ever taken spinach and taken a cup of spinach and microwaved it? It's actually probably gonna shrink more than a half a cup, but that's just kind of an easy way for USD to describe how much food you need to serve. Um, on the flip side, if you do anything dried, uh, if you serve say a fourth of a cup, when, if, if those um, raisins were to reconstitute, they'd be much bigger. So that's why they say that you dried fruit, um, if you serve a fourth of a cup, then you can have a half of a cup. That's what it would credit towards. It doubles what it credits. Some, these are some meat meat alternates. Some of these again show up when you look at the meal patterns, but just a reminder that two tablespoons of peanut butter equal one ounce, one large egg equals two ounces, yogurt four ounces is one ounce, and natural cheese is um, ounce for ounce if it's real cheese. Now we're going to try to get into some, some non-credible products. So these are some things I want you to be cautious of that to make sure that you're not serving. This has happened a couple of times, so we just want to bring it up that what is not credible yogurt. So if you buy yogurt, it needs to be yogurt that is commercially prepared, but you cannot make homemade yogurt. It does not count. You can't do frozen yogurt like ice cream because we've had people do that. Um, homemade yogurt, again, you can have drinkable yogurts, flavored um, product, yogurt flavored products. You can have yogurt covered fruits or raisins, um, yogurt bars. It has to be um, just plain yogurt. As a matter of fact, USDA even specifically says if you have a gogurt, you can't freeze it. So even if it's like a gogurt that you freeze, they you can freeze it and then unthaw it, but they don't want the kid actually having a frozen yogurt. I don't know what their thought process is on that, but they actually don't even want that. But I had some centers that were serving ice cream frozen yogurt ice cream. And I was like, oh no, they're like, but we can serve yogurt. I'm like, oh, not the same, not the same. Um, another, something else is just to make sure you are, and this is all in the food buying guide, which we're going to touch on. Um, anything that's a cheese product, anything that says cheese product does not count on our program. Another one that says cheese product, that's what Velveeta says. So that's why it is not creditable. Um, it's an, more of an imitation. Now, if you were to look at um, Cheese, if it says cheese, processed cheese, then that's real cheese. But anything that says cheese product is not real cheese. So lunch meats, this is, this is actually nothing new. Like that's the thing, this is really nothing new. We've just been really laxed about this and then literally for 20 years, we talk about it all the time in staff meeting for people that have been on staff longer than I have. We always talk about this and we finally decided, no, we're going to put our kind of put our feet down. This is what a creditable lunch peat is. And if you are not meeting these requirements, then we're going to take back the meals. So your lunch meat, the label on the package must read exactly as stated in the food as purchasing column in the food buying guide, which I'll go over. Um, or you have to have a CN label or a product formulation statement. Um, again, if it does not meet one of these criteria, we're going to take back meals. So one thing that you can to make it easy on you is you can do like all beef bologna, beef bologna, beef hot dogs, um, a grilled cheese using real cheese. You can do chicken salad, tuna salad uh, that you make yourself. You can make your own pimento cheese. Um, but if you're going to buy lunch meat like ham or turkey is mostly what we're talking about here you have to lose your food buying guide. You have, so this is a copy of the food buying guide from online and here's the food purchasing column. So if you look down, these are all hams. All these are hams, there's like four pages of hams, but it must state on the label, pork mild cured, fully cooked, chilled or frozen, ham with natural juices, smoked without bone. Now there's also footnotes here that they're on a whole nother page. So you would when you buy something, it has to match exactly um, for you in order for you to purchase it. Now, if it doesn't, we're going to take back meals, but I'll go ahead and tell you too, 
if you're going, you're at the store and you're and you're going to Sam's or wherever Walmart. And when you're shopping, you're going to the location where like the cheese section is and you have those sliced deli meats. None of those are going to work. You have to go to the back where they slice the meat for you. That's the meats that are going to work. And you're going to have to ask for a copy of the label. Now, there is something in the food buying guide and there is something that you can find. I ha It's been a few years, I'll be honest. But um, Jenny O makes what we call a turkey ham. It says turkey ham on the label. If you go in the food buying guide, you'll find turkey ham. So that way, if it says turkey ham, it's turkey ham. It doesn't have to say all this other stuff like mild cured, fully cooked, da 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 da. Um, if you do that, then if you do that turkey ham, one pound equals one point uh, equals eleven point one pound, which is sixteen ounces, will give you eleven point four one one ounce servings. So that one will work. My thing is to you, um, I would stick with bologna. I would stick with, I would stick with doing stuff like that. If you're, if you're gonna do a sandwich, maybe if you're if you're doing peanut butter, do peanut butter. Um, we if you're if you have older kids, make sure people that do peanut butter they usually because you don't want to put four tablespoons of peanut butter on bread. It's a lot. It's actually a fourth of a cup of peanut butter on a sandwich that you may do two tablespoons to do one ounce, and then give like a, a lot of schools a lot of times we'll give a cheese stick. So, so as long as the total amount is two ounces, but you just may not want to deal with doing the lunch meat situation. So um, it's this has been an area of contention for years and years and years and years. And the consultants, we've all kind of, this has always been the rule. Um, some have been more lenient, some have not. We're just, this is what it is. Like we're all tired of not being on the same page. We're now on the same page of what does constitute. If you use a vendor um, like Benny Key, Cisco, Tankers, League, Guderian, um, Mid America, any of those, um, they you can get CN labeled products from them. So this is something else that we see quite a bit. These do not meet any requirements on the food program. If you are serving a potato chip or veggie straws, if the first ingredient is a, a vegetable or a potato, it does not count on the program. Now, the chips that do count are anything that has corn, the ingredient is corn, because corn's actually a grain, um, corn meal or flour. So um, if, if, and you can find some whole corn, um, like if it's Doritos, Cheetos, Fritos, Sun Chips count, and tortilla chips. But if it has a vegetable in it, they do not count. They do not, they're not part of the program. Um, it's just interesting because a lot of people understand this and they don't serve it at school or at, you know, at school or at the daycare. But when you guys do field trips, a lot of times you guys will do a potato chip and it doesn't count. Potato chips don't mean anything. It is not reimbursable. You'll get meals taken back for this. If this is your only component. If you use it, we see a lot of veggie sticks at snack. It is not a veggie. It is nothing. So if you want to serve like a chip item, which you have to be careful with the age, you can do Cheetos. Um, or people, um, salsa and tortilla chips are a big one with with high with um, with high school kids or with um, grade school kids, I should say, the older kids. So now let's talk about some mixed dishes. Um, mixed dishes again are anything that may have to have a CN label, like pizza, breakfast, burrito, anything that um, it has like a grain and maybe another ingredient with it. You do have to have documentation. So we would need a product formulation statement or a CN label. There is a website right here. This website is not just because you're like, oh, well, I serve a corn dog and then I'm just gonna go here and find a corn dog. That's not what this really is, is um, USDA. Um, they started a few years ago. I'm trying to think if it was 2017 when they started it. If it, I think it was actually a little bit before, but they started this website. And what they do now is CN labels actually have an expiration date. And um, it's not on the CN label, but that's what this kind of tells us. If you click in here, it lets us know if, if the product is still a valid product or not. That you're because I mean, I will, and I'll show you um, on this one. So they only last for five, I think five years is when a CN label is good for. So if you look at this CN label, if you look at where the green arrow is, you'll see at, in the box, that's the CN label. If you look inside the box at the very last sentence it, in the parentheses, it says use of this logo and statement authorized by the Food and Nutrition Service. 
USDA and it says four slash 17. What this tells me is that this CN label was good. It was, it, this CN label was created in April of 2017. So it's really only good for about five years. Now, what I've been told is that, and it may just be situational, but I have been told, so this is a chicken nugget from Sam's and I've been told that you can no longer find this product. And maybe you can find it at some places, it's just they're not able to keep it in stock, but I've heard right now that they can't, they can't find this. When you do, if you do use anything with a CN label, please make sure to write the CN label number in the box, uh, in your production records or menu of serve form. So it, what you'll see here is like in the box, in the top uh, right hand corner, it has 095730. That's the CN number. Um, if you get it from a vendor, this you'll see that big old red box is 024569 in the top right hand corner of the whole page. That is your product number. That's not your CN number. Your CN number is inside the box. So just make sure if you are um, using a CN label, we do want to have the CN number and the CN label just to make sure because you may switch products. Schools do it all the time or the, the, the CN labels change quite a bit and um, the product may have changed. Like they may have discontinued one item and started kind of serving another one, even though it looks completely the same to you. When one ingredient changes at all in a product, um, the company has to go get a new CN label. So the, the whole packaging still may look exactly the same, but they may change one tiny bit of formulation to the product and they have to get a new um, CN label and you may not realize. So always make sure you're make, so you only have to keep one CN label, but every time that you do, I would write down the label from the newest version you have, but always just keep an eye to make sure it hasn't changed. So that's just my helpful hint. Now, if you do use a, we always have to have at least original. We can have a photocopy or a photograph, but it must be visible and legible. If we can't read it, then we can't use it. And not just that, but, and, and we do this, not just with the watermark, but we do this one. So we have what's called watermark CN labels. If you are buying your stuff from a vendor and just say, you know that this product had a CN label on it, you made sure of it, but now you can't find it because you didn't really, you didn't really cut off the CN label because you're like, every time we use it, it's on the box. So I just want to show the, you know, the consultant it's on the box and something happens. Well, when you, if you, you call the vendor, say you're using like Cisco, US Foods, Tankers Lake, Guderian, Mid-America, any of those, and you call them like, hey, I can't find my CN label, send me a CN label to your vendor. They may send you an electronic copy. And if they do, we can accept it, but we will also, ha we have to also look at your invoice, but we also do that with even your, your other chicken nuggets or whatever you buy. We also kind of look at your, your, your receipts to make sure it's kind of the same one. But how do we know that it's a watermarked is if you can, in this red box, it says sample copy, not for document federal mill requirement. And then a lot of times that USDA um, emblem will be marked out. So that's to me, we know it will say a statement on there like we got the that the you have a copy of it, but this is not from the box. So we have to make sure that you're using the same product. This is something very new, new as of like October. Um, infant combination now food for uh, jarred baby foods. It's very interesting. So if if there's at least one credible component in the combination food, it may be offered. So this is kind of like a CN label for baby foods. Um, if the package does not list the volume or the percentage of each credible ingredient, then you will need more information. And if percentage is listed, you may need to calculate the amount. And I'm going to, this will make more sense when we go through this. So um, this is just a little bit of copy about the infants if you're buying baby food. Um, so there, it's called credible food items. And I just uploaded this document, this infant food, um, feeding infants. Uh, I put this feeding infants document in meal patterns today. We're hoping to get another little heading for infants, but it, the document is so large, you have to kind of, it's a link to go get it. It's so large, we can't upload it. But if you don't know what, anything that's in there, you can feed them. Some things that they say that are not credible are barley, cooked grains, um, granola, macaroni, or pasta, and any mixed grains. 
So this is a photocopy of one that our, one of our consultants, she went and got it for me. But if you can see here, it says like an eighth of a cup of sweet potato, one and a half teaspoon of turkey and two and a half tablespoons of cooked grains. So you can use this and it does give us the cup. So you can use it as a sweet potato and the turkey because at least one grain is, one component is credible. Now, um, for instance, the grain, I don't know, it says mixed grains are not credible. So I don't know about these cooked grains. But if you also look at the other one, it has, I for, it had like a half of a cup, but at least it says cup. Um, it says one and a half teaspoon of chicken and then two tablespoons of cooked rice or pasta. Well, pasta is not allowable, but you can use it towards the vegetable and the chicken component. Um, so if you want more about this, that we have it in Spanish and in English about the crediting combination foods. It's a really, really good handout. It goes into much more detail. Um, it is now in the meal pattern section. And like I said, we're hoping to get an infant section soon. So that will be listed in there, but you do have to keep a copy of this. So just make sure you keep a copy of that if you're going to be serving some of these items. And then product formulation statement, to be honest with you, I would really not attempt to do this. Um, it's you are it's based on you. About, the company sends you a letter and says basically it has this, this, and this, and this is what we're crediting towards. Um, I have seen from the same company, and I'm talking big companies, Kellogg's, Tyson, I've seen, I'm trying to think who else, General Mills maybe. Um, I've seen several product formulation statements from the, all of these same companies and half of them will be good, half of them will be bad. Uh, the biggest thing is it has to provide crediting information based on the food buying guide. If you are interested in doing something like this, getting a product formulation statement, I suggest you send it to your consultant or to us. You can send it to me, that's fine. And we'll take a look at it. But um, if it's not credible and we come out and you were serving, you're like, but I have the statement from them. You are the one approving that statement. Not like the company just wrote it out, said this is what it is but you are the one who essentially um, approved it. Now, when you have a CN label, USDA approves it. It's, a, it's kind of a stamp of approval from USDA. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense, but I kind of maybe stare away, away from the product formulation statements just because they're very hard to get and most of them are not correct, even from the same company and big companies. People are like, oh, but it's from Tyson or Kellogg's or General Mills. No, I've seen them good and bad. But if you are, I've had this, we had this happen a lot when, especially when Sam's quit doing CN labeled products in general, they're like, well, then what else am I supposed to serve? And you can make things, anything you make homemade does not need a label because you can tell us how much you put into it. So instead of doing a corn dog, do pigs in a blanket. I had one lady who always did the frozen bean burritos and she's like, well, what am I supposed to do? I'm like, well, make your own bean burrito. She's like, well, how am I supposed to do that? I'm like, well, refried beans and cheese. Matter of fact, her kids liked it. And what she even started, she went even a step above that and started making her own, cooked her own beans and put it in there. And she's like, the kids eat it even better than they did before. And it's a lot less expensive. Instead of doing chicken nuggets, take chicken tenders and mix it with shake and bake or any other breading that you want to do. Make your own pizza, use biscuit dough, bagels, or a pre made crust. Make your own pizza sticks, use breadsticks with cheese to make cheese and marinara. You can just buy breadsticks and then put cheese on top of it. So, you can make your own, a lot of people think that they have to do heat and serve, but you can make your own items um, because you can tell us how much it is. When their combination, like when say it's a bre cheese breadstick, um, or maybe you even put pepperoni on your bread, your pizza sticks. When you can tell us how much bread and then how much cheese you put on it, that's perfect. If that's the thing with the CN label, that's what it's for is because we don't know how much meat is in it. We don't know how much um, grain is in it. So that is the purpose. And then one other thing is you cannot deep fat fry. Deep fat frying is not allowable. Um, what deep fat frying is, is when you submerge it in hot oil. I really, I have only had one center do this and uh, they're not on the program anymore, but I don't see anybody deep fat frying, but it is deep fat frying. You can pan fry. Um, and it could have been, for instance, like say when you, if, when you buy chicken nuggets, they were deep fat fried. But when you reheat them, you cannot deep fat fry them. You can air fry them, you can bake them, you can do anything. You can even pan fry, but you cannot deep fat fry. Can't get a fryer. So now let's talk about record keeping. Okay, so the menu is served records. So you need to make sure that you list the number of children eating for each age group. List the total quantity served for each component. List the CN label number, 
be sure you check regular or at risk if you are a daycare center and do both programs. Check the whole grain box and indicate what type of milk that you're serving. But what I am going to do real quick is um, I got to return a quick phone call. Let's take a quick 10 minute break um, and come back at 210 and then we're going to finish up. We do not have much further to go. We'll probably be done by three. But um, let's just take a quick 10 minute break. And if you have any questions, let me know. I'll put on some music and we will get started back at Okay, so this is the part like, um, I just kind of want to, again, I need to then make a phone call, but just a quick break before we talk about like the menu to serve record keeping for us, because um, this is where a lot of people have their issues. Um, you have to list on your menu to serve form what you actually served. It's not writing down the minimum meal pattern requirements. We already know what they are. They're listed on the forms that we've given you. What you put is what is on your menu as serve records is what you actually served. And I'm gonna show you how we really like you to fill it out. Um, and I'll explain why. Um, so the descriptions that about that food prepared for meal service must be documented on the menu as serve form. So you can do things in pounds, in cups. Um, you need to be very specific. Um, again, you are required to serve certain amounts of food, so you have to be very specific whenever you're writing information down with us. Now, I know we have a school district on, so if you're for school, you can go ahead and we actually highly suggest it. Don't, you don't have to do the menu of serve form. You just do the production records that you've always done because it's actually much more detailed. Um, and the fact when you're an at-risk program, you can do offer versus serve, which is not allowed um, for, uh, for daycare centers. So, I just kind of wanted to let you know, if you are a school, you don't have to use this form. You can do what you've already been doing because it is much more uh, detailed than the menu of serve form. So this is an example. This is the one that we have, I believe in the book. So if you notice on here, when you're writing things down, you need to give us really the total amounts. Um, so like for instance, it says for breakfast, for, whole, for the grain, they served a whole grain corn flake they served one 32 ounce box. That's what they served. Now, it's not, if you get, put a whole box, I'm just gonna say, if you put a whole box out there, so you put a one 32 ounce box out there, but only, they only ate half of it, then you really need to put a half of a, of a 32 ounce box, you can put 16 ounce box. It's what you serve to them, unless you, unless you were disposing of the other half if they did not eat it. But whatever you serve them, it needs to be on here what you served. We've I've seen it a couple of times where a center would tell me like maybe the requirement was that they need to serve five pounds of meat, but they really serve seven pounds of meat, but they put five pounds of meat. I'm like, well, why did you put five pounds if you serve seven pounds? And they're like, well, I'm just putting the minimum meal pattern requirements. That's not what we need. And not just that, we understand DHS requires seconds on certain food items. You know, we can pull DHS records at any time if we want to look at them, just like DHS can pull our records. And not just that, but if you're buying all this food, so say you're buying seven pounds of hamburger meat every time but on the menu serve forms, you're telling us you're serving five pounds, but you're always actually serving seven and you're buying seven for every meal. 
Well, it shows that you're buying way more food than you're actually serving. So it kind of, it's a little bit, well, why are you buying it if you're not needing it? So you need to make sure that you are writing down exactly what you're serving or what you're serving, not just the minimum requirements, because we've seen that quite a bit. It needs to be what you're actually serving. The reason it, we like it to be like this as well, and, and just think about this. So for lunch, they serve spaghetti. In this example, they serve two pounds of spaghetti, 20% fat, 80, 20 ground beef. They served one pound of spaghetti noodles. They served two 15 ounce cans of um, green beans. They served two 15 ounce cans of tomato sauce. That was for their sauce. They served two 15 ounce cans of peaches and they served three fourths gallon low fat white milk. Now, if you think about it, COVID is a crazy time for everybody. People are in and out all the time. Maybe the director is gone for something and then the cook is out due to COVID. Well, when someone comes in and they're trying to figure out, so you have a teacher that's coming in like, well, I'll just go cook something um, for the kids. And they're like, but I don't know what to cook or how much I have to cook. What they can do is, is they can go back and look at your records to see what you served. This is like a menu. This also helps people if they have to come in and substitute of how, what to cook. So for instance, if say that this day there's 10 kids there but this production record shows 15 kids. So she can serve the same thing and know that she's in requirements. Um, because like, if you put on here, we've had people put like 15, two ounces of meat. Well, how do they know? How do, how do they know how much to prepare if that's all you put? Or if you put, um, so it's, this is three to five-year-olds, 15, three to five-year-olds. So say for the green beans, it, they said um, half a cup green beans, 15 but they don't know how much to open up. They don't know how much to prepare because they know it's 15 cups, but they don't know what 15 cups is or half a cups. So we say, please do it like this. We do the math. Um, that's what the food buying guide is actually for as well, which we would talk about. But think of it as a recipe. If somebody needs to come in and prepare food, they can come in and be like, okay, I have 10 kids today. Say you're an out, you know, you're a head start. So all your kids are three, three through five-year-olds. And it's like, okay, I can, I just need to do two pounds of gram. Um, ground beef, one pound of spaghetti, and then open up two number 10 or two number 15 ounce, two 15 ounce cans, two cans of tomato sauce for the spaghetti, and then um, two 15 ounce cans of peaches, and then they know how much milk to serve, and they'll be in requirements. So think of it that way. Think of it as a recipe, and if no one else is there and some random person has to end up cooking, which is very plausible in this time, this day and age, that they can come in and they know how much to prepare just by looking at your old menu of serve forms. So does anybody have any questions regarding the menu of serve forms? You also need to make sure you let us know which meals have the whole grain rich item in it. Some people are not marking the boxes and say you don't want to mark the box, circle, circle the WG. We're tr we try to make it easy. You write whole grain on there. You write WG, but you have to indicate to us which item is whole grain. Any questions? Um, if there's any special dietary needs, it's also very helpful to put it in the comments. Um, maybe like you have a child that takes almond milk. We need to know that. Anything like that. If you have teachers that eat, your program adults, if you have program adults, program adults are those that work at the center. Um, if your program adults eat, are you serving enough food? Because this, everything that's listed in, the, in these boxes should cover the program adults and the kids. And we see it all the time. Um, that, and maybe, for instance, we, what we have also seen is maybe the center serves breakfast, lunch, PM snack, and supper. And there was 20 kids at breakfast, 20 kids at lunch, say 30 kids at snack, and 30 kids at supper. Well, at breakfast, they're only claiming nine kids because the, um, half of those kids are eating supper with you. So you're gonna claim them at supper, not for breakfast. Well, you write in, the, in breakfast how many kids you served that ate a meal, not what you claimed. So if there were 20 kids there for breakfast, even though you're claiming nine meals, you have to tell us how much you prepared for those 20 kids. And again, if you have program adults, we're figuring that in here because if you're telling us that those adults are eating, then we have to figure that 
in all of this. So again, if you're only putting the minimum meal patterns and you're feeding adults as well, you're, you're gonna be short on food. So I just wanna make sure we have a lot of issues with the menu is served. I'd like to do eventually like a one hour training on just how to fill this out. But for right now, this is what we have. So, um, cause we're, again, we're trying to do a lot in a short amount of time. But again, if you have any questions regarding this and if you need any, if you need your consultant to come out and help you with this, call them. If you want them to look at your menu of serve forms and be like, just take a look at this. What do you think? Call them, send it to them. They have their email addresses. They would love to hear it. Um, again, your menus listed on the form. Now it says if pre-filling out with menu items must write in the quantity served in each component column. So what does that mean? So maybe you're using a something like minute menu and minute menu will tell you like, if you have 10 kids here that are this age, it will tell you you need three, I'm just making up numbers. They're just, maybe minute menu says you need 2.84 gallons of milk and you need 1.111 number 10 cans of peaches, because that's what you're going to serve that day. And maybe it says that you need 3.14 pounds of hamburger meat. So it's letting you know how much that you need. Again, even though they're giving you that information, that's not your production record. You still have to hand write in some place how much you serve them. I mean, if it said you needed 3.145 pounds of hamburger meat, how much did you really cook? Did you did you just open up three and a half pounds? What, I mean, how did you, did you have a scale? Did you weigh the 3.1? And the milk, if it says that you need like 2.845 gallons of milk, did you just open up three gallons of milk or did you really do the 2.8536, whatever it told you? Most of the time you're gonna round up, you're gonna round up. So you're not gonna just like, for instance, it says a number 10 can, you would need point, nine zero one one number 10 can are you really going to write that down or are you going to put that you served one number 10 can because you're going to serve it all out so just think about things like that if it is something that you can pre-fill and that's a minute menu is the only one that i'm really aware of so that's why i use menu menu as my example we also have what's called a calculating servings it this is a this is a great 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 form this is also in the min, manual but we we have it all in the interactive forms as well on, on resource library. So if you open up the resource library and you scroll down to the worksheet, you'll go to the calculating servings. Then you'll open it up and we should have one in there for adults too. Um, I Let me double check all that because I thought I made one for adults, but if we didn't, I will get one and we will put it um, down there in their interactive section form. But what it does is, uh, this is an example of breakfast. This is the one that's in your train in your manual. So for breakfast that day, you had three one to two year olds, five three to five year olds, and two six to twelve year olds. So what you do is all you do is you plug in three five two, three five two, three five two in the components that they're eating. And with breakfast, they didn't need a meat; they just did a green instead. So it tells them for milk, it does the math for you that you need fifty eight fluid ounces of milk. Well, we know that um, a half of a gallon is 64 ounces, so I bet you would just serve 64, a uh, half a gallon of milk for breakfast. Then this also tells me that they need 17 one fourth cups of fruit. And then it also states that you need 12 and um, half servings. And then that, and then it gives you an idea. And then on your production records, it just lets you know how much that you need. So, um, I'm going to talk about here in a minute about the food buying guide and how these both play in together and how you use both of these um, to help figure out like how do I know what 17 one fourth cups is and I'll show you how we figure that out. But this is a really great form. You don't have to print this out. I had someone in my territory in one of my territories that when she had a new cook, we didn't even have this electronic. She did it by hand. She made her cook do this form for every single meal service and attach it to the menu a serve form because this is not a menu a serve form this is just telling you how much you need menu a serve form is how much you actually served but she had her cook fill out this form and attach it to her each menu a, menu a serve form because she wanted her to realize how much she needed and get in for a while until she really she under, realized that she understood what she was doing but it's a, like i'm telling you it's a great form you don't even have to print this out she did, it's just interactive. You can open it up, fill out the calculations. It can tell you what you need. And then that way you know how much to um, fill out or how much to open up. It's really, really, really good. 
So again, you must maintain your labels. You need your CN labels, whole grain, breakfast cereal, yogurt, and any lunch meat that you buy based off of the food buying guide. So make sure you have that. Something else I would highly suggest is an inventory. It's not required. I wish it was. I think it's highly suggested. If you are a school district, a school district is required to have inventory. Um, it's just you have commodities. It's required for you to do so. So um, for purchased and perpetual, and for purchased and for commodities. Now with milk, uh, we really, again, highly suggest the milk. What we cannot do is we can't, we're not allowed to look at really any receipts from previous months. So that's why we can look at the, the inventory. So say that you buy groceries every Tuesday and Tuesday happened to be the 31st of the month. And we come out and look at it. So say we, so, so it's November, no, it's December. Gosh, it's crazy. So say it's December now, I'm looking at November records and you bought milk on October 31st. I can't look at that October 31st um, receipt. But if you have an inventory, I can look at your inventory. So let's say on October 31st, you bought 10 gallons of milk and you have a smaller center. And when I come out, you are eight gallons short of milk. Well, if you had an inventory that you put how much you had at the end of the month on October, I could have used that uh, 10 gallons or however many gallons you had left over. I can use that instead of a receipt. Like I use that to and incorporate it into what you have. So that way you wouldn't be short on milk. But if you didn't have an inventory, you'd be short on milk and I have to take back all your meals. So it's just, again, very highly suggested. Um, it's also, again, I highly recommend inventory for your purchased items. Again, if you're a school district, you're, you're required to do that. But it lets you know what you have. And this is actually from a school district as well, is I had a district that the lady ordered the same thing every month or every two weeks or however often she's purchased. And then the lady left and they hired someplace else, somebody else. The thing was they weren't using what they bought. She, they had pallets and pallets. They almost did the whole summer, their whole summer feeding program based on just stuff that they had in inventory because they weren't using half of it. So inventory is really good. It lets you know what you have. Um, and I hate to say this, but it's happened a lot. And I, I've said this at a couple of centers I went to about inventory and they're like, how did you know I'm putting in cameras right now or I'm about to put in locks on the freezer. But say you buy 50 pounds of hamburger meat for the month. And on your menu of serve form, you serve 20 pounds of hamburger meat. So that means you should have 30 pounds of hamburger meat left to go into the next month. Well, you go to the, you go to the um, if you were doing your inventory, you would say you have 30 pounds left, but you go to your freezer and you don't have any hamburger meat left. What happened to it? Unfortunately, and it happens in schools too. We've seen it in both, but sometimes food goes out the back door. People are taking the food. So if you have an inventory, it's also keeping track of like how like, so say you catch the person that's doing it, it has a dollar amount tied to that. But I think it's just, it's just, to me, it's very important to keep inventory, especially because we can't look at receipts from previous months. If we come out to do a review and you told us that you served 50 pounds of hamburger meat for the month and we look at your receipts and we have no hamburger meat, we can take back all those meals because there's no receipts that have any hamburger meat in it. So, but if you have an inventory, we can look at your inventory, so. Just keep that in mind. Um, I will state this too. Um, this will probably be more for like other people, but I have, I talk about hamburger meat. I am a small town country girl. We butcher our own. And um, you can do that. You can butcher your own as long as it is processed in a federal, um, a federally or state inspected processing plant. The only problem is, is if you want to do that now, it, it's about a year to two year wait out to get anything processed. But you can do that. And I would, if you do anything like that, keep an inventory of just the meat. Like, so say you have a steer and you get a total of 650 pounds of beef. Um, I would keep a running total of that. People also have gardens. You can use it, your garden. If you do have a garden, again, keep inventory because we have, if we have no receipts, I had one uh, daycare that had about six gardens. And so if you, they had zucchini and all this other stuff, I would put in there each, like every day, how much they harvested if you have a skill, you know, weigh it and then tell us how much you're using. And that way that can be your receipt. So if you're using anything that you really don't have a receipt for, um, cause I understand if you butcher beef, it's gonna last you um, hopefully all year. Or if you have a garden, you're not gonna have a receipt for that. Um, but 
make sure you're keeping an inventory of what you collected and then how much you're using because we have to see it someplace coming in and out. So now we're going to talk about the food buying guide. Um, so I'm going to talk about the food buying guide. It gets a little bit confusing, but there's some things that I think will be very, very helpful. So this is the website. If you want to do the food buying guide online, we have mailed everybody a food buying guide years ago when they came out. Um, I mean, we re-emailed them. These new ones came about three or four years ago. Um, but I will say, if you can't find it now, I'll tell you, don't ask us for one. And the reason I tell you that, because there's some much easier forms for you to do. One, you can get this electronically, but there's a couple things I'm going to show you that I think you'll like. But what is the concept of the food buying guide? So everything that is listed in the food buying guide is, is allowable. So if you look in the food buying guide and you can find it in there, you can serve it. So for instance, you can find venison, you can find tripe, you can find um, chili con carne, as long as if you buy chili, uh, the package says chili con carne, if it is in there, you can serve it and it tells you how much you can get out of that container or per pound or anything like that. It tells you how many servings you will get from a specific food item. And it will tell you the quantity of raw product to cook. And we'll, that's the big one. I'll talk to you about that one. And then how much food you need to buy. That's why it's called the food buying guide, but really you're not, you're not just using it for buying, you're using it for really serving. It should be the food serving guide. The reason I would tell you you don't want us it, to send you one is I would definitely, definitely use the USDA food buying guide app. Um, I have it on my phone. It is much, much easier to understand than it is for the food buying guide. We're gonna go over how to read the food buying guide, but if you download the food buying guide app, it works again for Android and for iPhones, um, you type into it and it's just, it's more in paragraph form, which is much easier to understand than it is doing the food buying guide, which again, I will show you here momentarily. So I really highly recommend the app and not just that the big, the book is so big, the app is much easier. And that way when you type it in, if it doesn't pop up, then that means that you, it doesn't count that you will need us if it's not in the food buying guide, you need a CN label or a product formulation statement like chicken nugget is not in there. My other favorite book is called the CACFP crediting handbook. This is located in the resource library. The crediting handbook to me is the cliff notes version of the food buying guide. This is what it looks like. You may see some of this. It looks like this in our manual. So the one in our manual, this came out I can't remember when this came out, but when we got a hold of this copy of this, um, our, our, we were almost done with the training manual and we did not update the training manual. So this is correct. That one, it would have, it would have delayed the, the training manual much, much more than what it was already a little bit delayed. Um, so this is new. Don't look into the, don't really look in the book if you can help it for this information. Look into this food crediting handbook. It Again, it's a great, great resource. This right here is, um, a screenshot from the meat section. So it will tell you like, is canned or frozen combination food, stews, beefaroni, chili macaroni, pizzas, pot pies, or raviolis, do those count? And it says maybe, and it says these are products are credible only if they have one a C and label or two a product formulation statement. And that tells you what to look for. Um, it also talks about, um, can you do canned or pressed luncheon meat, potted or deviled, no. And then you also have things like refried beans and it'll say see page 1-12 of the food buying guide. So it, it's the Cliff Notes versions. Look here first before you go. Um, it's about 90 pages. Um, it's a great, great book. And it may even just also give you the link, but I think the whole thing's out there. We have some things that the books are not that big, but USDA made them so big and colorful and all this stuff that they're too large for us to upload, but we always get the links of where to find them. So I'm going to talk about the food buying guide, um, of how you read it. Again, I would suggest the app, and I also suggest the crediting handbook. I think if you, if the crediting handbook tells you to do something, yes, you can go to the page number, but I also think just going to the app is much, much easier to read. So this is a section from the meat section. This is one of the most common ones is the uh, ground beef 80-20. So the deal with USDA is, so... Uh, a pound is 16 ounces. That is what one pound is. One pound equals 16 ounces. USDA, when they talk about they want a child to get one ounce of meat, one and a half ounce of meat, whatever it is they want them to have, they want them to ingest that. They don't want it just to be like, yeah, no, with 16 pounds, you know, 16 
um, ounces divide, if it's supposed to be two ounces, divide it by two and you'll get eight ounces, we're good. No, when you cook meat, ground meat, that's 80-20, it does shrink down along with chicken, along with everything else. So what this food buying guide tells us is if you're buying ground beef 80-20, which is where the red arrow is, if you buy it, say, per pound, the second column is how you purchased it, that one pound of 80-20 ground meat will give you 11.8 one ounces of cooked lean meat. So column three and four go together. That's what this means. Because when, it, and if you look, if you scroll down, you have one with 15% fat then 10% fat. Every time there's less fat in it, you get more product because it doesn't cook down as much. Now column five, a lot of our schools use this, or even if you have a larger center, what this means is if you needed 100 one ounce servings, then you would tell you right here, if you go to column five, if you need 100 servings, so if you need 100 one ounce servings, you would need to cook 8.5 pounds of meat. And then you'll see right underneath it, there's kind of a gray, it says pound and it says 7.89. Well, what that says is say that you're a head start and all of your kids are three to five year olds. So that means that they all need one and a half ounce. So they try to help you out and say that if you have one pound of hamburger meat, one pound cooked will give you 7.89, one and a half ounces of lean cooked meat. So say that you, again, you have a head start and you have 13 kids how much you would need two pounds of hamburger meat. So it's a really, again, this is a really great resource. It's just kind of hard to understand. It does give you additional information or anything in the comment section in column six, but um, to, it, for some reason, and I get it, it took me a long time to figure this book out when I was on staff, but the app is just much, much, much easier to understand. It's just, it makes, it's just written, the format is so much easier. It's not formatted like this. The only other thing I wanna to bring to your attention, again, this is the vegetable and fruit section. So when we were talking about that calculating servings form, it said that you need 17 one fourth cups. Everything listed in the vegetable and fruit section in, in the food buying guide, including the app is all in one fourth increments. So it's always gonna say one fourth cup. That's why it says that. So if it said that you needed 17 one fourth cups, you can easily come here, say you are gonna do green beans. Um, well, you can do a number 10 can, if you do a half a cup heated, it's 39.5. But if you do a half a cup unheated, or I mean a fourth a cup unheated, it gives you 52.2 one fourth cup servings. But if you scroll down um, to the number 300 can, it will give you um, 6.9 drained. It'll give you four something if it's heated. So um, if you needed 17, you may want to do the pounds. So maybe if you buy it by the pound, you buy it frozen. So, and you had 17 kids, you could do two pounds. You would know how to open it up. So that's how they correlate with each other is that calculating servings form. You go back to the food buying guide to figure out how much you need. Again, the vegetable and fruit section will always go back to one fourth cups. It's for all of it because it's if when all the meal patterns are in one fourth cup increments, it's an eighth of a cup, a fourth of a cup, a half a cup, three fourths of a cup and one cup. So that's why they, they did it this particular way. So there are some recipes. I actually got an email from USDA um, regarding uh, standardized recipes. They just came out with a whole bunch more. I highly suggest them. They are really, really good. And not just that, but say you want to do chicken pot pie, it will tell you how to serve it. Like if you serve one cup, it will give you one grain and say two ounces of meat and a half of a cup of vegetable. So if you do, and they're good recipes. I would tell you though, if you use them, um, you, you can tell us, you can write down how much you served or you can give us the recipe number. Uh, now the daycare, the CACFP ones, they are for like 15 to 25. Um, wait, I'm sorry. I think they're like, yeah, I think they're like 15 to 25 serving size, but the school ones are 50 and 100. So if you have a larger center, like if, you, if your center holds 30, but maybe you have five or 10 staff that you feed as well, you may wanna do the school side and, and prepare 50. So, but you do, if you do a recipe, you can either write down the totals, like I use this much chicken, this much vegetable, you can do that. 
you are also more than welcome to put the recipe number. You can put like chicken pot pie and we'll, I mean, I'm making it up. B12, I still remember B12 is the hot roll recipe for schools, but um, it will give you like say C12, you can put pot pie C12 and then you have to let us know how many servings. Did you do 25 servings? Did you do the 50 servings? Don't, if you do want to mess with the recipe, you can always mess with them. But if you really want to keep it true to what it is, don't change the meat, don't change any breading and or any grain in it, and don't change any vegetable in it. Um, but you can definitely change and play with the spices because that it, they determined it based on what's already in there. So I just want to kind of give you a heads up on that, but they really are good recipes. Now, I do this in the other in the other training that I do as well, but people are kind of curious. I want to give you reasons that may cause an overclaim. So what, what would you do for us to have to take back money? So that is if you do not serve one whole grain rich item per day, if you serve juice more than once per day, if you serve juice to infants, I'll say that as well because they're not, it's not allowed. You serve lunch meat that does not meet requirements. If you serve a grain-based dessert, which is the donuts, the cookies. Um, if you're serving food items not found in the food buying guide, um, they don't have a CN label or a product formulation statement. If you are serving not enough food, or if you're not writing the food, that happens a lot too, that you're not writing the food on your production record or your menu of serve forms, or if you do have meals that you contract with say a school or somebody else and you do not have those meal delivery receipts, we'll take mag meals for that. Um, it wasn't also mentioned in here that you also need, like if you're serving a grain-based dessert, um, I, did I mention, oh, I did, okay. If you serve a cookies, all that stuff, that will be taken back. Um, so now we're gonna talk, about, just the last thing we're gonna talk about is meal service. Um, I'm gonna talk very, a little bit about it. Um, and a lot of this is, when we get to this one section is gonna mostly also be for our schools and for our daycares or for our adults. But I'm going to talk about two types of pre-plated and family style. Family style, I'm going to tell you what it is. I'm not going to talk a whole lot about it because it's, if you're good, if you want to do family style, which I love, love family style, you need to talk to your health department first. The federal government for Head Start or anybody else, I think even three star required to do family style, they have halted it um, because of COVID. So what does, and so, but we've also had the flip side, people did family style. They don't know what, what pre-plated means because they've always done family style. What pre-plated is, is when the pack, when the meal is all on the plate at one time. So all the food components and the minimum quantities must be on the plate when served. And you have to serve everything around the same time. So you, what has also happened is we've had people give them the meal and then they're like, I'm like, well, what about the milk? And they're like, oh, we'll give them that after they eat because they usually will drink the milk and then they're full. You cannot do that. You have to give, you can give them the plate and then be like, I'm pouring the milk next. So I want to give them their food first, but I'm pouring the milk and giving it to them. You can do that. You cannot halt giving them something because they may, it's the child's choice. If they drink too much milk and don't eat well, that's, that's the child's choice. We don't dictate that. You have to give them everything at one time and it has to be the minimum serving size. So for instance, you have a one-year-old, let's just say you do a cheese and bologna sandwich the bologna is one ounce, but you do the imitation cheese that doesn't count. Um, so, and you cut it in half and you give them half of the sandwich, but that's only a half an ounce of meat. And I'm like, and if we come out and look at that, we'll be like, well, where's, they only got a half an ounce of meat. They're like, oh no, well, I'm giving them the second half after they eat the first one. You cannot do that. If they have to have one ounce of meat and that whole sandwich is one ounce of meat, you have to give it the whole time, that first time it's served out. It's called seconds when you do it afterwards. What family style is, is when you allow children and adults to serve themselves in a common, from a common bowl or platter, um, supervising adults may provide some assistance. But what is the difference is with family style is everybody's portion is sitting in the bowl. And the child or the adult or whoever's fixing their plate, they can choose to put it on their plate, put part of it on their plate. Um, they can refuse it but their portion is in the bowl. And if they don't take it, you still are throwing it out. I find there's less plate waste and other kids, like I tell people I didn't like peas. And so if another kid didn't like peas and they didn't want to put any on their plate, I'd probably eat their peas for them, but I didn't like fruit. So someone else could have my fruit because you can't eat off of each other's plate. But if you do it family style, you don't have to take it. I understand if you're Head Start, Head Start requires that you put the full serving size on the plate. Um, that's Head Start rules, that's not our rules but um, they can take smaller portions. 
And again, the meal is reimbursable as long as all the food components are offered in, in that bowl. So that's just the difference between those two items. So offer versus serve for, this is the only thing that's allowed for adult daycare facilities and schools participating in at-risk only are the only ones that are allowed to do this. Not even if you're a nonprofit at risk, only if you're a school at risk or adult day. If you go to the adult section in the resource library, we have more information. We also added a page this year, it's on page 330 about um, offer versus serve to help you out. But what offer versus serve is, is that you, a participant may decline one or two food items. Um, they can't decline at snack, but it's because they're not going to eat it and it does have less plate waste for, um, and they're adults. The, the deal with CACFP, the younger kids, schools have always been able to do what we call offer versus serve. So that's why they're allowed to do it. Adults are allowed to do it because they're adults and they've been eating a long time and they're pretty finicky. I mean, we already took away their sweets. But the deal with this program, the whole point of CACFP is to off to be on the program. It's to offer more nutritious kids meals to kids that may not have access to the nutrition. So they want them to try everything. They want them to be exposed to all food items. That's why daycares do not have access to offer versus serve. They want them to eat everything. They want them to try everything and all these nutritious stuff. When you're older or at a school, they have these options to do more offer versus serve. That's just kind of the background of why if you're a daycare, you're not allowed to do this. So at breakfast, you must offer four items. We talked about, we did talk about only three components are required, but we're talking about food items. If you do offer versus serve, you have to offer four food items. So it can be a milk, fruit, vegetable, grain, meat, meat alternate, or any additional item. Um, so for instance, you may want to do milk, a fruit, a piece of toast, and scrambled eggs. You can do that. You could also do, say, milk, fruit, let's say you want to do a yogurt, um, or, and then you want to do hash browns. You can do that. Your, your fourth item can be anything that you want it to be. Um, or yeah, you could have toast and hash browns, whatever you want that fourth component to be, it can be, but you have to offer four items for offer versus serve. They only have to take three on their plate, but they have to take three. So just for offer versus serve, um, they can they only have to take three food items once four food items are offered. Lunch is a little bit different. Lunch is five components. So we know the components are milk, um, meat, meat alternate, vegetable, fruit, and grain. So um, it, milk is optional for supper for adults, but um, milk, those are the, these are the five components and they must take three of the components. So they must either, say you're having spaghetti, the, the menu that we had before, spaghetti with um, green beans, fruit and milk. Um, as long as they take like say the spaghetti and maybe they want the green beans, that's three items because they took the meat, the grain and the vegetable. Or maybe they want the spaghetti and they want, um, maybe, you, maybe you also do spaghetti for your adults, maybe you do spaghetti with meat sauce, um, green beans, peaches, and then you also do a, a um, milk and then you also have a breadstick with it. Now your breadstick and pot, so maybe they want your spaghetti, breads and breadstick. They still have to have another item because the grant, you, that's only two components. The breadstick and the pasta are one component and then the meat is the meat sauce. So they also have to take a third item. It's by components. So breakfast is by food items and by lunch, it's food components that are three. So I hope that helps. If you are still confused about this, please contact me. I'll try and help you out. There's a, we put some more information uh, again on page 330. And then USDA has a form that we did upload as well in the adult section for um, offer versus serve. I really appreciate you guys being with us today. Um, this is the pages of the original institute institution on, it's on page 231 and page 349. I'm going to be around here for questions if you need anything. Again, we are not sending out um, certificates as long as you were on the class and then um, and you're signed in the training calendar, which I think you guys were, then you will show it will show your credit in the in your application system. So if you look either in your application, scroll down below the documents or if you go to the business maintenance page it will show up there 
Right now, I think it just shows that somebody attended. It doesn't say a name. We're trying to get that changed. But again, we're kind of fumbling along because we used to not have emails. We used to not have a lot of things in our program. And with COVID, we're just kind of learning and, and patching things as we go. So we're trying to get things fixed to make it better. So it'll actually show your name that you attended because you may have three people signed up and only one attended. But that's what it is for now. But we have it on our end. So we can pull it up on our end to see that you attended and which actual person attended. Again, if you need anything, um, I'm here. I'll be here for a little bit. I'll put some music back on. Thanks again for coming. Um, hope to see you guys soon. Have a very, very Merry Christmas.